Hello everyone, it's me, Juan Gummy4, back again in another video, and today, well, MadPad truly did stay on his word. We are here with part two of his theory. Everyone, you guys already know that last time I already reacted to the supposed part one of this series. Well, part one of this analysis that MadPad is doing. And he said that he was going to do a part two, and I said that look out... You know, to stay on the lookout because as soon as part two hits, I'm going to make a video. Tell me why immediately after I get, like, immediately why I get to work, I see the notification. I was like, oh. But anyways, yes, we're going to be doing a reaction video and we're going to be doing this, all right? Also, if the video gets cut off and we have to do part two, then that means I still need to work on the storage. Like, literally, I'm trying to work on that. But anyways, here we go. Oh, come on! Oh, God. Retreat! What? Okay. I don't think I need to join you. Vibe check. constantly reaching and stretching for answers so kind of like the nerdier version of mommy long legs and welcome back to our coverage of poppy playtime probably We're back. should rename the game populous playtime since two chapters in and we've spent like five minutes with the character and of those <laughs> five minutes like none of it's actually been playing so just a clickbait title across the board last episode we broke down two of the biggest mysteries people were asking about this latest installment the first yep, this video this video we reacted last time doll here. in my very first theory for the game we concluded that poppy was created using the soul and body parts of stella graber an employee of playtime co however this chapter revealed that stella was still very much alive when mommy long legs was introduced back in the 1990s considering mm -hmm. that poppy was invented in the 1950s timeline didn't really work out so who then is poppy well it turns out she's the adopted daughter of playtime co's founder elliot ludwig a girl who died tragically sometime in the 1960s according to evidence in the game he managed to revive her inside the poppy doll but was unsure of how he did it. This led to thousands of experiments where he tried to harness the power of poppy flowers to bring toys to life. Experiment 1006 would be the one to prove successful, giving rise to a new type of living toy, the prototype. This monster made up the other half of that previous theory as we looked into the big pointy clawed beast. It's an experiment that yep. we're told is smarter and more dangerous than any other experiment in the factory. Okay. Considering we've been up against this... Oh, God! This, this eh, him being that much smarter doesn't really bode too well for us jeez i was not expecting jump scares come on man but talking about these two is only really scratching the surface of what's really happening at playtime co what are these living toys made from who are we in all of this will this game ever not be similar to fnaf and why is a caterpillar dog with elf feet so disturbing to the very core of my being well i think i have answers to all these questions and more because <sighs> okay um I think uh, the the toys are made up from multiple souls. May it be uh, male, may it be uh, adults, maybe. I don't know. Um, who are we? Um, random worker coming back. I mean, hey, I mean, it happened with Henry from Bendy and the Ink Machine, so why not? And uh, this... Uh, yeah, uh, I would like to see who, who, 
invented that idea in this game universe. Uh, Alright, maybe not the last two, but definitely the first couple. And by the end of today's episode, we'll be that much closer to figuring out all the twists and turns that Poppy has planned. Spoiler alert! I think that we might be the true villain of this whole narrative. Let's start what? with the makeup of the monsters. Originally, we suspected that the flesh and blood of former employees was being used to help create the sentient toys that are now chasing us around the factory. I mean, look at all the blood in this place. And usually it's found alongside a broken toy. Plus, as Huggy Wuggy falls into the abyss at the end of chapter one, he leaves blood splatter on all the pipes that he hits on his way down. Combine that with our theory that Stella was inside a poppy, and boom, you got yourself a recipe for the most gruesome company health plan ever. However, chapter two seems to be pulling us in a different direction. Once you defeat Mommy Longlegs and get back to the game station to free Poppy, you can find two notes on either side of the control panel. Uh -huh. One is about a scientist complaining about the lack of natural light in the lab, which, let me tell you, as someone who literally locks himself in a closet to work an episode, it's totally get that. Hashtag relatable. But it's the second note that I want us to pay attention to. It starts off harmless enough. Just a list of instructions for employees working on the game station floor. Quote, start by reporting to the control station. Always okay. keep a minimum distance of 20 yards away from mommy long legs. The okay. train will arrive with the children at 8 a.m. All children will be gathered inside the game station all at once. The order of the games will be musical memory, whack a wuggy, then statues. A series of uh -huh. bridges and doors from a control station should guide you to each game. End quote. Yes. I mean, you know, it's all pretty straight forward stuff but it it's is the last section where my theorist senses really start to prick up what Again, only one child should ever play a game at a time children who are not playing a game will wait in the game station there's playground equipment to keep them entertained record okay. each child's performance as it's relevant to each game music memory composure memory pattern recognition right. wacka wuggy hand-eye coordination and reaction times statues agility strength and speed oh, once the God. children have left for the day return to the control station give all reports to miss stella graver to sort through End quote. The children weren't just playing any old games. These games were specifically designed to test children and monitor their skills. And that's not all. Of course. Because of course, children, aka human beings, are better lab rats than, la than lab rats. Of course it is. Oh, when you break out of the statues game, you can actually find two of these reports hidden inside the room for a child named Michaela Hissim. Each proctor goes through and explains how Michaela performed in each task. Quote, she has a good grasp on the concept and decent performance, but Michaela made mistakes on several of the color patterns. In her second attempt, she was making noticeable improvements. Quote again, Michaela is very accurate and fast. Few mistakes were made. You can actually see this improvement reflected in her scores, going from 331 to 434. However, notice what's written right at the top of the page underneath the child's name the name of the proctor is another category assigned toy for Michaela, this was candy cat now why would you need to assign a specific toy to each individual child unless of course you needed that child to have some kind of deep connection with the toy for some kind of supernatural purpose like say turning the child into that toy of Certainly course sounds like something that happened in an indie horror game and look at this right at the start of the chapter we find this note in elliot ludwig's office that talks about his experiments with dead rats and using the poppy flower to try and revive According to the document, it doesn't work. We talked about all that last episode. Yeah. However, something we didn't mention last episode was that at the end of the note, Elliot leaves us with this parting thought. Quote, perhaps something larger than a rat would yield different results. Of course. Oh, Reese's, please. Relax, Suddenly it all begins to fit together. The testing of the kids, assigning them a toy. It's not for their own betterment. It's in order to provide larger subjects for Elliot's experiments. He isn't stuffing his employees into toys to bring them to life. He's using children. Oh, come on. Just when I thought we would get through an episode without a FNAF reference. But that's not all. <sighs> of course. Of course. Uh, I hope that... Is it always, is it truly children? I mean, let's be honest. I feel like, I, I mean, I'm not trying to compare, but Super Horror Mike made another video. And uh, I still think that, you know, maybe it's both the disgruntled workers as well as children. I mean, let's not, I mean, you really think, I mean, come on. We saw the tape in Poppy Playtime with Jacksepticeye. Fun fact, he was in the game. But... You know, the way how they were talking to their cut their workers seemed to be like, eh, we don't really care if we have to turn our workers into our test subjects. We're making profits. 
Uh, it's just me. It's just me. Poppy Playtime saw FNAF's dead kids and said, hold my remnants. Because if stuffing kids wasn't bad enough, these aren't just any children. They're orphans. <sighs> Let's start of statues, before we even see any of these child-testing papers, Mommy gives us a little monologue about why she's trying to kill us. It was always so sad to see the picture. They called me Mommy because I was the closest thing they ever had to us. Yeah. Called me mommy because I was the closest thing they ever had to one. Uh, all right, let me level with you. First off, I think they called you mommy because, you know, that's literally the name of your toy. We see the commercial at the very beginning of the chapter. Mm -hmm. You've also spent the entire game talking about yourself in the third person, so none of this should be a shock to you. But you know what? She's also probably right. If this day glow pink stretch spider is the closest thing the kids have to a mom, then yeah, chances are they're grown up parentless. This also directly aligns with the posters that we see throughout the factory. Posters that explicitly talk about Playtime Co.'s adoption program for orphans. In Chapter 2, it says, quote, Playtime Co. harbors a state-of-the-art education program for all orphan children. These children being tested are orphans. That's why, despite there being literally hundreds of experiments, notice that the experiment numbers go from the 800s all the way to the thousands, no missing children's reports are ever filed. I mean, heck, even Freddy's had to close after five. This also <laughs> applies to a select... Yeah. Dang. This is getting dark. Why is it always children's are getting the victims, man? Why is it always children? Remember the game's death screens. Nobody is here by choice. Yeah, these kids didn't choose to be here, to be adopted by the company or turned into toys. And I'm sure at this point they're all well aware of the fates that are worse than death like we see in another death screen. I still stand by our first theory on this one. I'm convinced that these death screens are Poppy talking to us. At the end of the chapter, she says that she has plans for us and prevents us from escaping on the train. This perfectly lines up with death screens like you can die later. This isn't about you and I still have plans for you. However, chapter two introduces a new mechanic into the death screens. You see, while those that I've Why? already mentioned all end with a flash of white, there are others that end with an ominous red screen. One of those red screens is even in a secret code like the one that we had in chapter one. I guess this okay. is just a thing that they do now. Last time we deciphered the code to give us the phrase, stay, they need help. Fortunately, the new one in chapter two uses a few of the same letters. In fact, the first word in this new code is exactly the same as one from the other code. Okay. They, followed by an apostrophe and two more letters. The second of which is also an E, so this is very clear there. The next there. two words get a little trickier as they contain letters that we haven't seen before, but after a bit of analysis and trial and error, I managed to decipher the whole thing to read, they're just hungry. This, on its own, doesn't really tell us anything new, but when you start to combine it with the other red screen messages, it starts to paint a bigger picture. The prototype has saved us. Isn't he wonderful? He is loose. This is an emergency lockdown. Innovation is key. May we forget death. This is no longer Poppy talking to us. She's horrified by the creation of these monsters using human test subjects. She right. doesn't like what's going on in the factory. No, these are the messages of someone else. Ooh. Someone so obsessed with overcoming death that they can't see past the issue with their own experiments. <sighs> like Joey Drew from Benny and the Ink Machine. Come on, guys. They're just hungry? That feels like the excuse of one of those parents that believes that their child can't do any wrong. Except, you know, they're talking about a giant human-consuming erector set monster. Yeah. These messages must be coming from either Elliot himself, the man who after the death of his daughter put his heart and soul into creating his toy empire, or one of the employees who believed in the cause so much that they were willing to sacrifice parentless children to find the solution. But why us? Why do we hear so many people talking in our ears when we die? In fact, why did we feel so compelled to return to the factory in the first place. I know we got ourselves a note saying that missing people were still here, but just not convinced that any minimum wage employee is going to risk their lives in a factory where people mysteriously went missing 10 years ago. And when the and especially thinking that there are still survivors in there. If there's if if survivors are still in there and they survived 10 years, then you, it's either they got plot armor or two, this is all a trap. They are gone. They are they are com they are now one in the box. They are one with the grass now. Giant Huggy suddenly went missing from the main atrium in the first chapter. Yeah, most people are gonna nope straight out of there. <laughs> and here we are facing monster after monster, fighting for our lives, determined to see this thing through. Why? Actually, exactly about this why? In chapter one, but at the time I just didn't have enough to give a definitive answer. Then here we are in chapter two, and mommy says this. So you, you worked here. Oh. So if anyone deserves to die alone, it's you. How does she know that we worked here unless she recognizes us? We know thanks to tapes from people like... No. Marcus